Hello everyone, and welcome to my Crusader Kings 3 custom character creation guide, which hopefully is going to work within the confines of creating the best meta character. Before we begin, there is always going to be two important pieces of information you should consider before watching. The number one, in Crusader Kings 3, it's often going to be the case that there isn't going to be one accepted meta, it's really going to come down to what kind of character you want to play. There are different things you may want to achieve, and so depending on your end goal, whatever this video suggests just might not be applicable for you, so bear that in mind. And two, we should always take note of the game version and which DLCs we have. This was recorded during Robe 1.8.1 with all the DLCs up to Friends and Foes, so if there's anything new, this video might be outdated, but it also might not be, so just bear it in mind. Without further ado, let's see if we can create a very, very good custom character. For the purposes of this video, I think I'm going to be creating my character in Mercia, although I don't really think it matters. I will say, however, that the majority of the content in the game is currently geared towards Catholicism, so a lot of my advice is going to be poised towards Catholicism, so if you're playing in India, it may be the case that something I say may not work the same way, but um, in general, this is still going to be pretty consistent across the board. So, let's just run down the categories as they are from left to right, and we begin with Sex and Sexual Orientation. CK3 is a medieval game set in a pretty, you know, traditional environment, and therefore it's practically always going to be the case that picking a male character who is straight is going to work to your advantage, especially if you want to have good inheritance and you want to make sure you're not seen as a sodomite of some kind. For that reason, being a straight male is probably going to be the most meta you can play, however you do have some alternative options. If you really wanted, you could always play as bisexual if you wanted to experiment on the fun side, but playing as homosexual or asexual is going to reduce your chances of getting children, which may or may not work in your advantage. As for playing as a woman, you do have an alternative strategy. The alternative option is heading into your game rules and looking through the wonderful collection of choices you have here. Um, specifically, you can start looking at things like gender equality and invert it. This way, you'll be able to play as a woman and men will be the ones in the uh, less dominant position, let's say. There are other things you can do in here uh, to do with same-sex relations and same-sex marriage. However, these are not Iron Man compatible. So sadly, bisexuality is going to be your best course of action if you want to help this out. But you can, if you want to, uh, increase homosexuality if you really want to find a hot boyfriend. Faith and religion. The religion side of Crusader Kings 3 in its current format might come across as slightly light, so the amount of interesting options you have to take advantage of may be somewhat finite, but I'm still going to go across some of the more interesting ones you have available to you. In the realms of Christianity, Catholicism is always going to be good because of the Pope. The Pope, of course, you can get asked for money from, assuming you have high standing and uh, good faith to ask for said money, as well as the fact that nobody's going to really war you if you're standing around in Europe with holy wars, and uh, considering the Pope does like to do an, an occasional crusade, it may be worth avoiding. Lollardy, while an unconventional choice, does have the tenet of pacifism, which is often forgotten to have plus one domain limit, so if you're going for a peaceful playthrough, then the extra late game domain limit may work to your advantage. Due to the Northern Lords DLC, Asatru is always going to be a really strong contender because all three of their uh, tenets have positive effects. Patron Gods allows you to pick something for some base stats, Warmonger allows for some really good early game conquest, and Blot basically allows you to get piety for executing prisoners. So all three have really great uses for some good early game expansion and early game strong characters. Some religions, however, you may take not necessarily based on their tenets alone, but due to their geography. This can be seen with insularism and Christiani, which is probably better demonstrated in the map. So here we are inside the world where we have a better looking religious map. And that's so that we can see that insularism, while it does have these relatively mid tenants, I mean, there's nothing crazy going on here. What they do have is holy sites that are all quite close to each other and not owned by any kingdoms. All of these are just duchy or individual county holders. So that means you can get the um, County Conversion Speed one, the Learning Per Level of Devotion one, and the uh, Religious Vassal Opinion one, all together so that you can create your own head of faith, which is really important 
because uh, there's a lot of places where that's going to be difficult to do because you're going to need something like the Vatican or you're going to need to go to Jerusalem and goodness knows that can be a nightmare. The other one this applies to is Christiani. I could never pronounce this correctly, which again, you know, monastism, it's fine. Uh, medicant preachers, again, basically very similar to monastism and pastoral isolation is kind of doesn't really let your faith do anything. But if you were looking for a reformation, the holy site here, very accessible. The holy site in Ragusa, weak, but very accessible. And the last one, which is in Hungary, a bit more difficult to get, but not at all impossible. Meaning that a nice, let's say, Balkan faith is very much so within your grasp. Something to consider. It's time for some culture. During Royal Court, we got access to a complete culture overhaul, which is possibly one of the best updates and changes they made to the entire game, because with all of the pillars and traditions they come with, there's a good amount of variety to choose from, and you can even merge cultures with wherever you are, so there are some pretty interesting combinations you could try and go for. So I think it would be fair to start by talking about one of the most powerful cultures in the game, that being the West Slavic Czechs. So, they were once extremely broken due to the industrious tradition, allowing them to massively stack the amount of development they can get every time a building was built. This has been patched now, so it doesn't work as strong. However, the effect is still extremely good combined with everything else they have. Um, the mountaineer ruralism is always going to be good if you've got any mountains near you. And I've always been a fan of castle keepers because of the renown you get from holding castle holdings. As it stands right now, there's no um, DLC to do with republics, so more often than not you're going to be holding castle holdings and every single one is going to give you renown. The Czechs just seem very strong. A series of fun cultures can be found in the Turkic branch. Um, there's quite a lot to choose from, but uh, a good one is going to be the Cumans. Something you're going to be looking for is the cultures that start with the most amount of traditions are generally going to be stronger because they just come with more buffs in general. So in this case, we've got Malleable Invaders, which is really good due to being able to uh, merge with wherever you conquer. So you conquer somebody, and the ability to hybridize is negative 75%. That is so important if you find yourself moving from one place to another. But also, all of their other traditions are just geared towards an easier time with conquest, which means it's a really good directed playthrough if you're going for something more martial. Moving on to the DLCs, we have to talk about Norse. Um, Norse, of course, being added in with the DLC, the Northern Lords, is just so really, really strong. It comes with Malleable Invaders, which works perfectly with their Veronikian Conquests. Coastal Warriors comes with some of the best uh, men at arms in the game, as well as Northern Stories and Performative Honor, literally just giving you straight buffs. I don't really value their Scandinavian elective too much because I can usually figure out the succession crisis, but if you want the ability to have um, things like Brave, uh, Gregarious, which is often seen as one of the best traits in the game, um, this is really good. I mean, just across the board, it's just so strong. If though, for whatever reason that doesn't tickle your fancy, perhaps the Iberian DLC is going to tickle your fancy because again, there are some very strong cultures in here. Uh, I think the strongest being Visigothic. It comes with the namesake Visigothic Codes, which allows you to go straight to High Partition Succession Law, effectively skipping one of the kind of early game hurdles that you're really going to struggle with, just having it right at the start of the game. Just make sure you've got Happy Vassals and you should be good to go. But it also comes with uh, malleable subjects, increasing your cultural acceptance game. So Conquest is going to be pretty good at foreign cultures. Um, ritualized friendship, which is really powerful if, let's say, there are some mechanics in the game that require you to have strong hooks, such as uh, strong hooks on the Holy Roman Empire, um, strong hooks on the Pope, then being able to just create a strong hook due to this one cultural tradition is really strong. Um, in my personal opinion, Visigothic is the best, with Norse coming as a strong second. We shall call him Pelagio. Moving on now to age. Age, you might say? Why is he talking about age? Age seems like a weird thing to be bringing up. Um, not at all. It's very important to creating your character within the 400 point limit. Um, otherwise, you're not achievement compatible. So, if we start getting rid of all of these skills, you will see that we're currently standing at 25 years for 67 points. That is because of your age. You can uh, lower this and increase this to lower this by increasing or lowering your age but the most 
old you can possibly be is between the years 24 all the way up to 28. So if you're anywhere between 24 and 28 years old, you are literally screwing yourself over in terms of capability. You're far better bringing yourself all the way down to being 16 years old and being able to choose your education or bringing it even further down, all the way down so that you can pick a personality trait uh, or other trait that's going to let you choose what your uh, education is more geared towards or just screwing it and being an absolute babino. For the purposes of this video, I think I'm going to be a zero year old. Traits with education. So just bringing it quickly back up to being a, a nice 20 year old, I'm basically going to go over this very, very quickly. Depending on what point of the game you're in, you're probably going to have to decide where you want to go. If you're very small, people generally like to focus on um, stewardship and then marshal. Gold is so important when you're small. It buys you mercenaries, it buys you buildings, it buys you pretty much everything you need to get by. After that, all you need is an army so you can grow to become a kingdom. If you're the middle of the line, maybe you're like a kingdom, maybe you're somewhat established, I often find that people are still gearing themselves kind of towards some stewardship, but learning is very quickly becoming a much more prominent factor because it lets you buy claims, live longer, uh, culturally get more technology. So learning is going to take over more. And then maybe if you find yourself further on into a game, or maybe you think you're going to be pretty strong and safe early on, then people will value learning very highly. Uh, gold will be now, there'll be too much gold, so you don't need to worry about stewardship anymore. And diplomacy is going to be really good because once you've got big enough, your real goal is going to be towards making sure you can keep the peace and making sure you can go around vassalizing other people and doing very easy wars against other people, which learning and diplomacy are really geared towards. Because we're playing as Mercia, in the end I'd hope to be getting something like Midas Touched, but I'm going to play as a baby, so I don't need to worry about education. Personality. In general, don't be a knob. Other traits. No, I'm just joking. Personality. So I could go down this list and do a gigantic tier list of what I think are the best, the medium, the okay, the unplayable traits, um, as some people choose to do. Uh, maybe I will, maybe I won't. But for this, I'm going to skip that and just go over what I think are the strongest traits you can go for. Temperate, in my eyes, has always been insanely powerful. The fact that it's virtuous to Catholics is always going to be a buff, especially if you're playing as a Catholic, but the stewardship and health bonus is never seen to come with a downside. I've never found uh, a stress event which has screwed me over because of temperate. It just seems ridiculously good. Next up, we have stubborn. I think this is the second strongest because it just gives you such a high, good stewardship. It does come with some very, very small debuffs, the lesion vassal opinion and a few events which cause you stress. But generally speaking, temperate and stubborn is just plus one domain limit combined. So really powerful, really strong, and a really good combo. For my third personality trait, it's going to vary depending on what you're really going for. Some would say lustful if you're really wanting to have lots of kids, but that can always end up with having too many kids and your entire kingdom explodes. Diligent is highly rated because of the stats it gives you. I mean, having eight stats is nothing to be scoffed at, as well as that really powerful decision, but the stress loss might screw you over if you're not really prepared for the events that could follow. So it's up to you if you want diligent. You could, you could not. Arrogant is often a trait that I think is overlooked because it comes with so many negatives, but the plus one prestige does has it use, uh, have, it, have its uses if you're playing as a tribal because all their men at arms require prestige to maintain. So what plus one prestige per month is more men at arms, which could be the difference between an early expansion and a failed one. Brave is really good for its base combat buffs across the board. Anybody who says the likelihood of dying in battle is a negative is a coward and they need to stop playing the game. <laughs> no, but in all seriousness, I really have never experienced too much negativity with Brave. It's very rarely going to screw you over. It's kind of fair because it punishes you for playing poorly, dying in a battle. Um, you shouldn't be finding yourselves in any battles where you're dying because you should have planned for that. Gregarious on its surface doesn't look too amazing because it's just, what, some diplomacy, some attractive opinion, personal scheme power? I think where the real joy of Gregarious comes in is the fact that feasts reduce so much more stress. It's effectively a stress relief personality trait, which, if you think you're going to be dealing with lots of stress, can really, really help. Now, for some warnings. 
Paranoid is one of the most broken traits in the game. It genuinely is on the verge of being a bug. Like, I am so almost certain it's a bug. The 100% stress game, I have seen events where it gave me 400 stress. It was like 396. I went from zero to almost committing suicide. Like, the amount of stress you gain from Paranoid in the events does not seem balanced at all. Avoid this like the bubonic plague. My god. Shy, while not appearing as terrible as Paranoid on the surface, definitely can have the problems of stress, uh, especially because of the Friends and Foes DLC. Paradox added a whole DLC about social interaction, tons of social events, children, friends, foes, all of it. Having a perk, uh, sorry, a trait, specifically to gain stress every time that happens, is going to cause your character to die, straight up. You should not pick Shy. Avoid like the plague. This stands not just for character creation, I'm talking about making sure your heirs have neither of these traits. And finally, we have other traits and skill points. These two sections are merged together because I often find that what you do with your skill points comes down to what points you have left over from picking traits. As a general rule of thumb, when you have the opportunity to pick a trait or a skill, you should probably be picking the trait because traits are usually better value for points than just clicking this button um, because it dramatically increases in price the higher you go. I mean, look how high it gets after that point. So, as I said, when it's like, you know, two, three points in this realm, it's, it's pretty okay to do. But beyond that, I would not do. I think it goes without saying that picking the congenitals traits is always going to be strong, but this video wouldn't be very complete if I didn't say things like Herculean, Genius, and Fecund are really good traits to pick up because they make you live longer, avoid disease, and have absolutely insane stat boosts as well as being able to complete your skill trees faster. Very powerful. Okay, let's talk now about maybe some of the more overlooked um, traits you could pick up. One that I personally enjoy, but I know is open to some debate, is Irritable. I often find that Irritable is actually pretty good for what it does because the stress loss you gain from it is quite, you know, surmountable considering you're losing a bit of diplomacy and a bit of martial. The downside is there may be some events where Irritable is going to screw you over. I do also like the Release Your Anger interaction as basically another coping mechanism. So for zero points, you basically have a free stress reliever with very little downside. But again, open to uh, open to thought. For just 15 points, you can always pick up Journaler or Confider, which again, stress, always worth keeping on top of. And these literally come with special decisions you can take whenever you want to keep an eye on it. So 15 points, not worth scoffing. If you ever find yourself having to pick between um, Robust or Hail, and perhaps one of the traits down here, such as Fecund or Strong, I'd say you should pretty much be picking Fecund and Strong. The inheritable nature of Robust is probably going to be finite compared to just finding a wife who's Robust or Herculean, and allowing her inheritance to do the work, because for 120 points, you're getting a medium health boost, versus Strong with its medium health boost. In short, you're paying 70 points for it being congenital. Those 70 points could go towards um, Shrewd, allowing you to have 10 stats across the board, as well as an extra 20 to spend on, well, whatever you want. I don't ever rate Robust, but I do rate Herculean, because the uh, buff you get on Herculean over Robust is doubled. So this is very good, this is mid, this is generally just bad. Speaking of Shrewd, I'm a big fan of Shrewd. Um, it's a similar argument that we had to uh, Herculean, but for the genius. If you don't feel yourself like you want to pick up quick, because you feel like the buff it gives you is too minor, with only one stat boost and a little bit of this for the congenital nature, you can pick up Shrewd and get double the amount of stats, um, but you lose the congenital nature. So if you think you can get a wife, then it's probably going to work out for you. For the martial prowess and prestige that Raider gives you, Raider isn't too bad a pick, especially if you're going to be playing a Raider character. You do get it naturally within the game, but sometimes you might find yourself having some awkwardness trying to get it. So if that's going to be an issue, 
an early raid it isn't a negative thing, but be aware you can get it later on in the game. And finally, let's just quickly cover Disloyal. Disloyal is one of those broken traits in the game that somehow works to your favour. Um, for losing a diplomacy and some liege opinion, you get 20 points to spend. But if you're playing as somebody who has no liege, this is 23 points for minus one diplomacy, which is very, very good. Um, this is basically extremely meta to exploit. You can do many things by exploiting this, um, because now we're down to 50 on this. So Disloyal, if you're going for a really good run, is basically a mandatory pick. With that, I think I'll design my meta character and we'll wrap up this video. A few moments later. So when all is said and done, my final choices were Herculean, Fecund, Strong, Shrewd, Journaler, with two points in stewardship and one point in prowess to get the full 400 points across the board. This character is going to live for an insane amount of time. We are talking like older than 100, which is plenty of time to get everything you want done. We're going to have time to get a good education trait because we're starting as a baby, which means three points. And we're leaving one personality trait open. So there's a little bit of RNG involved in this strat, but I don't want to spend the 30 or 40 points to get a personality trait. We'll just hopefully pick it up as a good one by picking a good tutor. Um, in general, we're getting close to having more stewardship to be able to get to the next domain limit. And I think across the board, you're going to be super duper strong. So that's it. Hopefully this won't be too contentious a video. I'll be looking forward to see if any um, Jabba the Hutt cat looking creatures come out of the woodwork and tell me that I'm a complete idiot. But maybe you agree, maybe you disagree. Maybe this was helpful, maybe it wasn't. Hopefully it was. Thank you very much for watching. If you liked, feel free to like, feel free to subscribe, and uh, hopefully there'll be more CK3 stuff in the future. Bye.